I welcome everybody on this evening of the, the masterclass at the Berlager Institute. Today uh, we'll have a, have a lecture by David Chipperfield. I am Rumo van Toren, also working for or work, working in the, the Berlager Institute, working on theory and analysis and history about architecture. Uh, as I said today, David Chipperfield will address a lecture. Friday, Za, Hadid will give a lecture, and on Wednesday, Vini Maas and Piero Fulians will give a lecture tomorrow. Uh, just to, to give a very short introduction about this masterclass and the work of David Chipperfield, I will tell you something about the masterclass and his work. David Chipperfield is a member of the generation grouped around the magazine you probably know. 9H. He educated at AA in London. He uh, was trained at the offices of Richard Rogers and Arnold Foster and founded his own office in 1984. He works in native London and in Japan. His work is especially influenced by the work of architects like the tectonics of Taro Hando, the minimalism and relation with nature in the work of Bayram, the contextual poetics of Sisa, and perhaps I think together or re related to the work of Stephen Hall, I think we will see some phenomenological relations between the work of David and of Stephen Hall. I think he has managed to discover a language of his own that has affinities with the oriental sensibility. Trenton uh, wrote in his introduction that sometimes even uh, in a way uh, David Chipfield is understanding the Japanese tradition better as you mean uh, some Japanese. We will see. <laughs> Good luck. Uh, to say something about the master class, I think in a way the work of Ta and Ethan David Chipfield is not the same. You can speak of two kinds of attitudes, or let's say two kinds of strategies, which are involved in designing a meeting place in the Bamboo Mir to memorize the death of people by the plane crash. So, one attitude I think is more or less argumented by the guests Zaha Dietz, Patrick Schumacher, Vini Maas, Benton Berg, and Pierre Pouillet, and the other attitude more or less is addressed by Hermann Hetzberger and David Chip. To say something about the first strategy, uh, I think it's a strategy in a way that tries to make an architecture which expresses the conditions we are in today. They try to write the tiger of time. So this architecture is much more influenced by contemporary aspects of our fast changing society. Images, speed, suburb, suburbs, metropolis, cars, aeroplanes, etc., etc. Theories from Virilio, Derrida, to name it. The other strategy, argument by Chip Hilp and Hetzberger, just to give you a rough frame of reference now, I'm, I'm very fast about these two attitudes. I think the, the second strategy is much more involved in formulating an architecture which will last whatever the contemporary time will bring. The culture of images and telecommunications and the loss of place ask for an architecture of nearness. Architecture is for them involved in the things which will last, on the social level and on the tectonic level. They think it's more than ever necessary to make durable social spaces in our complex society of today. I think both those two strategies can be of enormous help, especially during this masterclass, so they can have a kind of dialogue or kind of conflict discussing the different arguments. Because aspects of the nearness in relation with the human activities take place, and aspects of dealing with the Bijlmer, different cultures, and the role of the institution <coughs> have to be addressed. Well, to, just to name two quotes by David Chipperfield to give you an idea about uh, what he thinks about the social role or the role of architecture at large. I read two quotes. By continuously questioning conventional forms and methods, I believe that architecture should celebrate primary enjoyment and permanent 
phenomena, light, space, and nature. Fundamental and unquestionable, these primary elements survive everything. And another quote, as the world grows more complex, as technology creates endless possibilities, as the choice of image and reference increases, primary values become more fundamental not only to enjoyment but to understanding. The search for these basic qualities is the cornerstone of my approach to architecture. Qualities which transcend style, which demand that architecture not get in the way. Well, as finally, I want to pose a question perhaps to keep in mind, and which will then Chipperfoot will address in a way, answer in a way. That's the relation. What can ontological purity relate to a specific specific problem of life addressed by the means of architecture. And finally, perhaps a nice title of this lecture is, I hope David will agree, will, can be in search for essential qualities. That's it, thank you very much. Thank you. It seems um, <coughs> hardly necessary now to make my lecture. <laughs> You've given me a title, you've said what my work is, you've even <laughs> asked the question after the lecture. <coughs> but um, I thank you for making this framework. You've also teamed me with Herman, which of course I'm flattered. <laughs> but uh, it's uh, disappointing we're so outnumbered, I think, Herman. <coughs> it's rather unfair that we're against so many others. <coughs> um, should be a dialogue. Okay. Uh, the, through your introduction, you, you implied that um, <coughs> by opposition, we're not interested in writing the Tiger of Time, but <coughs> I mean, I would suggest that it's just a, a different way of writing the Tiger. You uh, summarized also, um, in a way, um, you've taken my lines slightly too much, but um, <coughs> I suppose that I should confirm that really what I'm interested in reinstating or what I'm interested in trying to confirm in my work is the, the physical world. That it seems to me that as architects we have a special um, position, a rather privileged position, that we're dealing with physical and tangible things and that um, if we were working with, um, if we were poets or we were working with literature, we might find ourselves rather jealous of, of people who had the privilege to work with um, physical phenomena. And I feel often that that particular um, power and position that we have is, is too often forgotten. <coughs> and that will be something I want to touch on. I, I also <coughs> um, of course, I had a perfectly balanced lecture already prepared until Herman asked me that, of course, I must talk about <coughs> the program. So now I'm completely uh, con confused about how to, to bring this into my talk. But I, I think it's important also to, to touch on you know, the, su the subject which <coughs> we've been talking about today, which I think all of us are finding tremendously difficult, but only, and I, w I will try and um, uh, talk about, I will try and make reference to, the, to this problem that we're given through my lecture, <coughs> but I would confirm that um, my position, my feeling about these things is in a situation of confusion, um, I resort to the physical as, as something that gives us a certain amount of confidence. Um, in my lecture, I will, I will try and, first of all, carry on this little um, summary, you know, sort of, um, I suppose, the closest one might get to a sort of philosophy. Um, but then I also want to talk about um, the method by which we work, because I think that um, the way that one works and, and the method by which one works is very connected to 
the way that one thinks and one's ambitions. <coughs> and I will explain um, a number of, uh, of conditions which have influenced the way that um, I think and work. Some of those conditions are very pragmatic. I mean, they're literally to do with it. the inability to get a certain type of work in England or the conservative taste, for instance, of the English, which is um, quite substantial and quite a substantial um, problem. Um, I will also um, talk about Japan and my experience in Japan as um, not because Japan offers any sort of exotic um, necessary image, but uh, quite simply that uh, most of my work has been in Japan. <laughs> Can I have the first slides, please? <coughs> Um, <coughs> among, uh, during my, um, I've been traveling to Japan for six or seven years, and one of the advantages is that I've made um, quite a number of friends <coughs> in different disciplines. And this is the work of uh, a very good friend of mine, Hiroshi Sugimoto, uh, a ph photographer. <coughs> um, who in fact lives most of his time in New York. He occupies his life by taking photographs of the sea. <coughs> uh, I think he's photographed 35 different seas. And, <coughs> uh, and now he's, he's um, taking photographs of, of lakes. And he convinces me that uh, <laughs> he convinces me that the light of fresh water is very different to the light from salt water. <coughs> what I like about his work, and I'm sort of being flippant, but you know, it's serious because to him, <coughs> he really is down to the quality of the light, and he can tell. I mean, I can't tell. I, I'm fairly sure that both of these are the Pacific. Um, one, I, I know one is from Japan and one is from America, different sides of the Pacific. He. He takes photographs of the sea. He takes photographs of the sea always from a, a certain elevation, avoiding a foreground. He's interested in the horizon. He's interested in the, in the, in the texture of the sea, but not in a, in a sort of um, romantic way. I mean, he's always trying to find... He won't photograph if the sea is too rough. He won't photograph if the sky is too strong. He's trying to find a sort of universality in the sea, but at the same time, talk about <coughs> you know, what I will continuously refer to as a sort of physicality of. And what's extraordinary is that it sounds a sort of um, ridiculously isolated um, perspective. But when you see 30 photographs of different seas around the world, and <coughs> even now he's taking the sea at night, beautiful, beautiful photographs of, of just the light that comes off of the sea. Um, they have a sort of a depth and an ambiguity and a sort of dimension, which I believe would be impossible to achieve by if he was setting out to try and say something profound. <coughs> there is a sort of profundity in his position which in a way attempts to say nothing. And the reason I show these slides because I always think of his work in, in this, and of course it's a bit Japanese to look at sort of emptiness in a way and, and, and read something more into it. But I believe this, um, this uh, confidence in the physical world and the phenomena of the physical world is, is um, something that we should always um, be in in touch with. I don't mean in touch in a sort of mother nature way even. I, you know, I'm not trying to be sort of ethnic and um, wholesome and moral as the word was last night. Um, I just believe it's a sort of touch, touch thing. Next slide please. <coughs> Two more C's. 
What's extraordinary is that, I mean, and you have to uh, uh, understand that you're not from, these slides are from a book which are already bad prints, but when you see the prints themselves, they are um, absolutely extraordinary, and you find the dimension in these things. Next slide, please. <coughs> Uh, this is Agnes Martin, <coughs> and um, in a way, uh, I'm very interested in the work of, of artists like Rothko and, and Martin and uh, people like this who are also starting from the same position of a sort of, um, of, a f of a faith in, in um, sort of physical and simple notions and that, and that um, the possibility of saying larger things by looking at smaller things. Next, please. Next slide, please. <coughs> As I was saying, that if, if um, I was a, a philosopher or a writer or Something. I think that seeing uh, images such as the Mies Barcelona Pavilion, or this is a project by Ando Tadao in um, south, southern Japan, if I was constricted by the written word, or even um, you know, the painted image, I would be um, tremendously jealous of the power of architecture and the power that we potentially hold over over this physical this physical world. Next, please. Um, I'm going to refer to Japan a number of times, but again, I don't want to refer out of some sort of exotic fantasy, <coughs> it is quite sincerely that um, I've spent as long working in Japan as I've, as I've, learnt, as I've spent working in, in England. Um, and more than that, um, I've found that I've s found certain illustrations for ideas which I don't believe are necessarily Japanese, but they are. Um, well, yes, often they are, I must admit, but there's a certain characteristic <coughs> which is maintained within the Japanese culture, which quite simply is still a confidence for um, the physical world, uh, which I find reassuring. The slide on the left is, is um, a wall in Kyoto. It's an, an approach to one of the temples. <coughs> and I, I will refer throughout the lecture to, to certain to ideas of, um, of emphasis that a tradition within Japanese composition is to exclude certain views and by the exclusion of some views you emphasize and give priority and emphasis to other things. Um, what's extraordinary if you walk, this is you know of course in itself a rather beautiful wall and you know, I could have taken this photograph at any position in the next you know, half mile, I, and I could have. It's it's not like it's sort of a set up photograph or anything. It's just I've just taken a wall, <coughs> and the wall is a device which sort of excludes the territory between, um, in a way that the area where um, most of uh, most of um, the chaos of our modern life, which was referred to before, sort of happens in our picture zone somewhere here. You know, one might imagine there's a car park behind here, and there very possibly is. Uh, but the wall, by excluding something behind, is emphasizing um, the, the foreground in one way. I mean, it's, you start to see it's moss, but when you're there, you can't help but realize that it's not just, um, it, it's given a sort of special,
presence. The Japanese have this particular ability to make certain normal things very important. I mean, I, and one isn't quite sure how they do it. Maybe it's just because by the time you arrive to Japan, you're so sensitized to the fact they're going to do it to you that you're looking for it. Um, but I, I do think that the, the technique of exclusion and emphasis is um, one which is practiced continuously. And in this case, you know, we're given two, two advantages. One is that the things in the foreground take on a sort of um, an aesthetic and physical uh, presence, which otherwise you probably wouldn't observe. And secondly, that the distance is given a sort of fantasy and, and ambiguity, you know, as if it was a sort of endless forest, which it's not. You know, there's a road 20 meters after that. Um, and so it's, it's sort of giving certain illusions and dimensions <coughs> um, which are, okay, manipulative, but completely sensual. The other slide is, <coughs> is my favorite bath. In, uh, it's in a uh, small inn in the mountains in Kyoto. Those of you that have um, had a bath in Japan uh, know exactly how you have a bath in Japan, but those of you who have not, I should, I should uh, explain that <coughs> the bath in Japan is, is not for washing. You wash, in this case there's a um, the bathroom carries on here, there are showers here and seats to sit on and scrub. You scrub and you wash and after you've re removed every piece of soap and dirt, at that point you can go into the bath. The bath is nothing to do with um, getting yourself clean. The bath is normally, and this is <coughs> now at low tide, but uh, when it's prepared for your bath, the bath will be, the water will be up here somewhere. And when you get into the bath, the water comes to the top and comes over the, the edge. And at that point, the bath sort of disappears. You know, this wooden, wonderfully smelling wooden box uh, disappears, you're sitting in absolutely pure crystal water and you're experiencing water. There's, there's no other reason to be in the bath but to experience water. The bath is about water, it's not about getting clean. In this case, what's rather beautiful as well is that <coughs> the bath <coughs> is exposed to the, to the river next door so that you sit in your bath experiencing water, looking at water. The whole uh, ritual is, is not practical, but uh, emotive. And this is, you know, we were staying in this inn for a week, and every time that <coughs> you seem to be, you know, not doing something, they'd ask you whether you want another bath. <coughs> uh, you know, you have two or three of these a day as a sort of ritualistic uh, immersion. Next, please. Um, I can tell a number of stories about these images. First of all, <coughs> uh, the reason I went to Japan was that I, I, first I made a shop for the fashion designer Ize Miyake. Uh, this is a, a garment of Ize Miyake um, in London, and, and that was uh, the reason for my uh, career, I suppose, in Japan. <coughs> the second uh, which is really referring to the image on the left, was that the, the shop I did for Miyake in London <coughs> was really my first uh, project. And um, the, it was a shop, uh, quite small, uh, 80 square meters, 75 square meters. And um, I, re I referred to earlier on the uh, conservative uh, aesthetic environment that we have in England. And I know this is a, this is a general disease or general virus. Uh, it's not just an English complaint, but <coughs> I think we, we um, uh, suffer this disease particularly badly. And we have champions like Prince Charles who reinforce and give validity to, you know, a sort of nostalgic position. And I made this shop, <coughs> which uh, 
in uh, journalistic parlance would be called minimalist and austere and uh, cold and uh, you know all these um, pejorative descriptions of such a thing. Um, and yet it became very successful um, and one of the things that seemed to me was that we used, or I used in this minimal uh, composition uh, quite strong materials, quite uh, you know, powerful I suppose, materials that had a lot of presence. The stone was, the, the floor was stone, very beautiful limestone. And uh, amongst this uh, composition was a table which we made from, uh, this is a top which is uh, about 11 foot long. It's carved from, from one uh, piece of wood in uh, it's sycamore and the, the top is folding but it folds uh, on both sides uh, alternatively so they, 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 the waves are moving in different, so there's a, there's a very complex surface <coughs> and um, a friend of mine after the shop had opened for a, a short while <coughs> had spent the um, afternoon sitting on the bench waiting for his wife to spend all his money and uh, he was there for an hour and a half or something. And he said to me, what was very interesting, that everybody that came to the shop touched the table. He said, not one person came into the shop without touching the table. And I found that very uh, sort of reassuring, that, that a sort of beautiful material seduces even you know, people that one imagines have no longer any taste or any sensual, you know, in my pessimistic moods it's tempting to believe that no one knows the difference between you know, a good fish and a bad fish or a piece of wood and a piece of plastic you know. and yet, what the lesson for me of this project was that was that actually underneath it material was a sort of, uh, and, and the physical presence of, of material was uh, a sort of bridge between this architecture which conventionally, especially in London, would be called austere and cold and you know, all these things. Next slide, please. Um, I'm going to show a number of slides of small projects. Um, these illustrate two things. One, a continuation of that which I've just been saying insofar that they gave me the opportunity to experiment with materials in a very immediate, very direct way. Um, and, and secondly, and in a way it's connected, uh, the, I suppose the, the sort of misfortune of being a young architect in London uh, in the last ten years was that <coughs> there was no, um, uh, no public projects being made. Thatcher stopped all you know, public expenditure. We have no competition system. There was no construction of schools or museums or these sorts of things, libraries or kindergartens. Um, we have really, uh, it's very difficult to get permission to build a modern house. Um, I managed to build one. Uh, we just receiving permission now for another one, which took one year to get permission, um, and that was against you know ridiculous opposition. And so the opportunities for the young architect in this period was either <coughs> uh, what we call the frock shop, you know the the fashion shop or the bathroom extension, or at one scale, or the big commercial projects. And the ambition for, the, for young architects in the 80s was to try and get these big commercial projects. There was no possibility of, of finding s intermediary scale projects, you know, the, the scale of project which I believe one learns one's uh, craft. So our diet for these years, and it's still our diet, I must say, it's, I don't want to give the idea that we used to do small projects and now we do big ones. You know. um, we still do small projects. We counted the other day that in, 
in seven years, we did something like 68 small projects. And each project has a client, has a budget, has a contractor. Has a That's, a, in a way, the negative side. The positive side is that these projects are without planning permission. You don't need to anybody to give you permission, to uh, aesthetic permission, because in, in England, we have, if you're building in the street, <coughs> a facade, then you're subject to a, you know, an aesthetic control. Um, the budgets are so small that you don't need a committee of people to say, well, you, you know, maybe it's not possible in this financial year. Or it's a <coughs> You're usually dealing with one person, one client, who is a direct client, and there is a personal relationship. The program the, the is so short, something, you know, some projects are six weeks between the arrival in the office and the completion. Uh, the maximum is like three or four months. <coughs> and so they are a continuous um, uh, sort of experimental food by which we can uh, make ideas without clients worrying about millions of pounds that it's not a big problem. They can say, okay, it seems okay to me, do it. You know. We don't have to convince anybody of the idea. So it's a, it's a very free place to play. Of course, the disadvantage is that there's a limit to the, to the um, potency of doing a fashion shop. I mean, it's not very profound. I mean, you can't make anything profound in a fashion store or a kitchen or anything. Um, so that's the background. I'll explain very quickly the projects. This is a shop for, another shop for Miyake in Japan. I wanted to do a uh, you know, in each project I try and sort of set uh, a task. The drawings become, in a, in a program of, of three months, the drawings become very secondary. The decisions are made much more closely with the space and with the materials available. I wanted to make a, a wooden wall in a massive wood, and um, I worked with a sculptor. I want uh, well, I'll start again. I wanted to make a wooden wall. And um, one of the problems in Japan is that the, the construction industry is so sophisticated that if you make a, a veneer, you know, a thin uh, wood wall, it looks like a solid wall. So if you make a solid wall, everyone would think it's a thin wall because they think no one uses solid wood in a shop. So <coughs> I was worried that if I made you know, this big idea to make a big wooden wall, everyone come in and say, it's a veneer wall. <laughs> so the, the, I then decided to work with a sculptor, uh, a Japanese sculptor. We chose a very beautiful wood, it's a camphor wood, which has a perfume. And we, or he carved this texture into the wood to signify, in a way, that this, and to give a, a material and physical presence to this wall. It was, in a way, a reinforcing of the, trying to find a sort of a reinforcement of, of the material of the wood, not by a sort of um, chipping in a, in a sort of ethnic, you know, as if some wood block, w wood chopper had cut it, but trying to find <coughs> a more uh, uh, abstract and intellectual way. Then this is a sort of big scar, which has silver, silver gilt, and this has a gold gilt. So this was about sort of, um, you know, it's, a, it's hardly a project. It was just a, a built idea, like a sculpture. Next, please. These are, I would just show very quickly <coughs> um, some typical interior projects. This is a interior, this is part of a, uh, a studio. This is part of a gallery. Next slides, please. Uh, these are both from a shop for Kenzo in London. And again, this is Cedar of Lebanon. I found a place, someone in London. We had some very big storms uh, six years ago, I guess. And some very beautiful trees fell. And someone in London bought some uh, from a big country house. And some beautiful trees of cedar of Lebanon. <clears throat> and I found where he was, and I found this wood, and, 
And so we designed this around the, the wood. Next, please. And the drawings of this, you know, I, we, they, they, I can't even really remember the drawings. They, they were sketches done in a workshop. Next, please. Um, this is a shop for uh, a shirt shop, a company I work for, equipment. The, as, well as, the, as well as the possibility these shops give, you know, to play with um, materials and an idea, just at that level, I mean, there's no big ideas in these projects, one has to say, there can't be. Um, the, the, what, the, what there is, is a sort of, um, it gives us, a, it do, they do give us a confidence in physical decisions. <coughs> I think one of the problems for, for us as architects is that so often <coughs> the distance and the time between an idea and the, the conception and the, and the commencement of a project and the physical reality of that project, you know, can be one, two, three, can be ten years. And in that time, you are having to convince planners, you're having to convince the client you're having to convince the building regulations people. You're having to convince the people who are using the building. You're having to convince everybody. And the method by which you convince them is drawings. And then you have to ha have the project costed. And, and the drawings become a sort of, um, a sort of method in themselves. <coughs> and I think that distance between the drawing board, where we are making decisions in a sort of vacuum, and uh, the sort of real, the reality of a decision is so long that I think often we've forgotten that a decision on a drawing board means a certain thing in physical terms. <coughs> I try and explain that. In, if in these shops, for instance, the, the decisions are not much more than making a white wall, making a window, making a wooden floor. If if I had to sell this project by drawing, the client would say, where's the project? I don't see it. It's not. I say, well, it's a beautiful wooden floor. Say, well, on the drawing, I can't see a wo beautiful wooden floor. It's not. You know, and I can say, well, the light from the window will be very nice. It's on the drawing, these things, which in the end are the most physically real things, are the things which cannot be communicated on a drawing. You can't, you can't sort of say on your drawing, <coughs> you know, well, you can say wooden floor, but it gives nothing to the drawing. But in reality, you know, when you take the floor and you say, well, let's find a way to, to show this you know, presence of the floor by making a step and making it thick, suddenly it becomes a, an element. You know. And uh, I think one of our advantages in these projects is that we don't have to convince anybody of that, just ourselves. We can go to the yard and see that this is elm, we can see the size of the boards, and we can see, the, say, okay, it's beautiful. It make a, you know, and then we go back to the drawing, we just say, okay. There's no, the drawing isn't a sort of substitute for an activity. It's a sort of, a loose, it's a way of, of loosely assembling a series of ideas. Next, please. Uh, this is the Miyaki shop in London. This was, you know, stone floor and a rail, and, I mean, this is an um, equipment store in New York, Madison Avenue. Next, please. This is equipment in Madison Avenue. Next, please. Uh, this is equipment store in uh, Paris Saint-Germain. You know, always it's just a series of, we're interested in just making spaces making objects which make that space into a fashion shop. If you, take this, if you take this object away, then it becomes a space again. Can you go back to the last two? Because I can explain. Just go back. Can you go back on the last slide? Yeah. I mean, it's maybe one again. Sorry. Can you go back again? I mean, in this space, if you take this away, and you take this away, 
and maybe, well, not even that drawer, but if you take those two things away, it's no longer a shop, it's just a space. And the space is made from a stone floor and white walls and a series of doors and a method of lighting. These things arrive anyway. They arrive after everything else is finished. This is made you know, stainless steel and this is wood. And they're, they're furniture pieces. So I'm not sort of interested in these projects to find a sort of programmatic complexity. The only thing that which makes this a shop is I made a rail. You know. If you took this away, this could just be a bench where you sit. Next, next, and next, and next. Okay. Um, I mean, to continue that exploration, we're now working a lot designing furniture. This is a range of furniture we, we did for a casino in Japan. This is al aluminium, um, honeycomb aluminium. It's all bolted uh, and can be flat packed. And this is a, a six millimeter veneer um, uh, glued onto the aluminium. Next, please. Okay. So, the um, I, I suppose in some way the <coughs> the accident of you know spending uh, a number of years with uh, quite modest ambitions of doing nothing more than some shops, <coughs> because uh, you know when we left college, the economic situation in London was not well. It was r probably rather the same as it is now. Uh, the prospects of, of doing any work were um, quite limited. Um, I think that that method of doing these small projects has influenced the way we think, not only in terms of, of a sort of experimentation of material, but also, as I said, that, that the decisions are very direct decisions. <coughs> so I would... You know, in a way, that's one sort of compartment of explanation of our work. Um, I now try and go on to a second chapter, I suppose. And I suppose one would... Um, uh, well, I'm going to show a, a house I did for a, a photographer. <coughs> uh, it's the only house I've done. Um, uh, the... It was an extension of an existing house for a young couple. <coughs> and he is a photographer and he needed um, uh, some more space. He wanted a studio for his photography and, and some more space more to extend the house. And uh, this is Tess now. And the sort of theme I sort of want, one of the themes I want to talk about here is, is the theme of you know, domestic life. <coughs> and, uh, you know, with Ben van Berkel last night, <coughs> after the, the lecture, we started to discuss um, the issue of values, and he was trying to suggest that um, he didn't want to take values, he didn't want to set up a, a value system, and I couldn't understand this, because it seems to me that that's all we do as architects, is to make decisions, and decisions are based on... on uh, a preference of whether something is better or something is worth, and finally, in, you know, one has to say it, in values. For me, as I've already tried to explain, one set of values I would, I would justify as a sort of physical, as, as a reinforcement of, of the sort of physical. <coughs> and the other, I would say, would be the, the reinforcement of the domestic. Because <coughs> I think that in the end, I mean, I find this image so appealing in its directness and in, in its humanity that finally, you know, we need a table, two chairs and a window um, in whatever form that might mean. I mean, it might mean the one on the left, but <coughs> I think that we should never go too far away in the way that we make decisions from the sort of domestic uh, mode or domestic uh, value. Next, please. Um, I'll come back to that, but I'll explain the, the project a bit. There was an existing house here. 
exactly in that footprint. Um, these were built in 1950, along here. This was a, a little building built in 1962, I think. A very ugly, small little house. The client received a permission with another architect to build a studio and extension here. So he came to me with a permission for a, a building with a sort of L shape. And um, the, the house, ori the original house is very small. The extension, in a way, is bigger, but still, if you put these two together, it's still a very small house. And I felt it was too small to make, you know, two buildings. And I was concerned to try and find a way to um, pull this thing into one object. The device was, was uh, to make this segment. And although I didn't have permission to do this, we sort of negotiated, I guess. Um, we cheated a bit about this. So I tried, in a way, the effort of the project was to make this space. Uh, the studio sits up here. This is the, the lights, the skylight of the studio. This is south, directly south. And this is the garden here. And we tried to treat the, the house and the garden as a sim single thing. Of course, I was influenced by Japan, and I was influenced by the technique of borrowing and uh, exclusion. <coughs> you can just see here the next house here and the next house here. The, the solution was a, a concrete arch, which comes the whole width of the garden here and supports the studio here. So the sort of boundary between the, the garden and the house is, I suppose, really the arch. And so, a bit like the bathroom, where exactly where you expect to be most private, you're thrown into the outside. The, the living room is very, you know, exposed to the garden, where in a sort of contrary way, the, the courtyard is working to try and protect itself as another room. Next, please. What was sort of interesting about the arch <coughs> was that it allowed us to take away the, the corner of the room. And it seemed to me that, the, that if you take away the corner, then you open the room in the most uh, <coughs> violent way. However big you make a window, nothing compares with taking the corner away. And it, it sort of disintegrates the, the room and makes this very you know, ambiguous condition. I mean, here's the, here's the glass. This is the garden becoming a jungle. And, you know, and the idea was that you expose the living room to the outside in the most, um, yes, let's say violent way. So the definition between the inside and outside is this just this black line coming here. And certain elements come through. Next, please. Can you try and push that one down? I think it's just got stuck. <coughs> Thank you. Um, these are just interior views. This is the entrance hall coming in. Um, yeah, it's looking back to the entrance hall. Next slide, please. So there you see the the arch here. This is the the sort of glass bowl at the corner. This is the studio. And what was interesting, because he was. Um, he was fanatic about the, the quality of the north light. We had to do um, uh, analysis, you know, artificial sky analysis of the, of the daylight that was coming into the studio by making a big model and putting it in the artificial sky. And, I mean, it's something we should do on every project, of course. We, as architects, we should do it without 
the client asking us. And we were, in this case, forced by the... I kept saying to the client, yes, we'll do it, don't worry, we'll do it. And we were lazy about it, but finally we did it. And what was interesting was that the things that we learnt, not just about... I mean, in fact, we learnt that what we were proposing on here would work without a problem. But we learnt a whole series of other things, which just by lowering a window a bit, we would get light further into this room. Or, and it became another theme of the, the, the project, that the, the way that we introduced the light into the building and the way that the building related and borrowed the garden became the sort of two obviously connected themes of the project, as well as this notion of, of, of um, exclusion. You can see here there's a, a sort of device where we, we made the bedroom window. This is the dining room uh, here. That's the dining room floor. Is the, the roof is the ceiling of the dining room is here, and this is the floor of the bedroom. The window of the bedroom is, is this high. So that when you're in your bedroom, you don't, you're, not looking over the gar you're not looking over the back gardens of the neighbors, but you're just looking um, down. When you lie in your bed, you can see the bottom of the garden. And when you stand up, you can only see here. And there was a very funny story that um, <coughs> the, the client is a photographer, and he's working all the week in the laboratory late at night, making his photographic prints. And, and um, uh, Futagawa from Japan wanted to come and photograph the house. And um, we made an appointment with him that he should go on Friday. And Futagawa never arrived on Friday. And they were in bed. The client and his wife were in bed in their bedroom <coughs> early in the morning, on a Saturday morning. And the bell rang. And they said, oh, shit. <laughs> so they stayed in bed. And and the bell rang and about nothing happened. And then, after 20 minutes, they heard a noise in the garden. And from their bed, lying down, they could see five Japanese <laughs> <laughs> photographers in the back garden photographing. And they were there for an hour. And of course, these people couldn't get up from their, from their um, bed because exactly the same view from... Uh, the advantage of the view from the inside is also a sort of strange advantage from the garden to the bedroom. Next, please. This is really the view from the bedroom, so, you, you know, it's, it's not quite, but this would be, if you're looking from your bedroom, you, you can only look down. This is the garden that we designed with um, birch trees and then different types of grasses. And this is, in a way, sort of showing the ambiguity between the you know, where the house is finishing and where the garden is beginning, and the sort of transparency of these rooms. Next, please. And always, you know, the, the image from the house is that the garden, <coughs> um, as it develops, becomes a sort of framed view. And it's, I mean, you could see on the earlier slides before the garden was grown, it's, it's um, tiny a tiny garden, but somehow it gives another you know, dimension to the house. This is you know, a, a reference. Next slide, please. Um, <coughs> I said that in this project we were forced to um, calculate uh, the effects of the daylight, and um, it did become a slightly obsessive um, uh, project of, you know, cutting holes in the roof in every possibility. You know. We found ourselves cutting <coughs> holes everywhere to, to get light down into <coughs> through, this is in the bathroom, there's one skylight coming here, but then there's another one on the other side. And, um, it's a sort of a rainwater nightmare. Um, but a bit, in a way, a sort of continuation of this uh, uh, experimentation with materials, the extraordinary aspect of this was that uh, with this client, the client was intelligent enough to understand that, that light was something which would become, you know, a very powerful element, you know, one would say material, in the design. And because he was he's a photographer and he's sensitive to that, it was not something I had to argue for. I mean, just he understood that and was very encouraging. And it's another theme which we've
become very interested in. And in the same way, it's a theme which is very difficult to um, discuss through drawing. It's not something you can put on your drawing very well. I mean, you can design a skylight, but it doesn't show evidence. Next slide, please. Uh, for instance, this was a window we discovered that um, there's a skylight in the corridor here. This is the bedroom window. We discovered on the model that because um, east is that way, if we cut this wall in the bedroom, then the east light would come into the bedroom. I mean, it's something we probably should have been able to calculate beforehand, but you know, a model, a physical model, and, a, and an artificial sky made that absolute, you know, real possibility for us. Next slide, please. Um, I want to continue this theme of light because it's something which is now um, uh, engaging us. <coughs> and uh, I have to confess to be a, a sort of um, a, a Luddite when it comes to uh, computer uh, technology and we have no CAD system, we, we have a word processor which I have no idea how to use. Um, I never even used, you know, I'm completely philistine about these things and I must say I'm not particularly interested in them as graphic or even constructive um, tools. <coughs> I, I suppose um, uh, they will arrive and we are in fact investigating now. Uh, we, and I have to also say we haven't really had the, the types of projects that needed them. Um, so, you know, they're on their way, I know. Progress will catch up with us. Um, but one area which I am an absolute uh, um, convert uh, religiously to is the possibility that computer programs can now allow us to speculate uh, and speculate in a very complicated way. They can allow us to speculate, uh, you know, thermal um, calculations which would be impossible to do beforehand. Um, and they are now allowing us to um, speculate very, in a very sophisticated way, um, daylight. Now, of course, it's not a problem to, to speculate light and shadow. Uh, this, these are, this is a project, um, it's a project project not being built. It's a, a house for a collector. There were two parts of the program. One was really a domestic program with a, a kitchen, uh, uh, a living room here, and a master bedroom. A, a living room and a, and a guest room here, and a master bedroom here. On this half of the project was a gallery for um, her collection of, of work, of, of contemporary art. And on the roof over the gallery is a swimming pool. So this, the top floor you know, bedroom has a swimming pool. This is the view from on the roof of the swimming pool. Here's the swimming pool. Um, these are very conventional, you know, three-dimensional computer models with l light and shadow. It's no big problem. And we could do this without a computer, of course. Um, but, you know, they're rather nice images. And, of course, it's, it's, it's much quicker now that we can... Uh, in fact, this project was for a site in, in uh, Italy, in Umbria, and uh, it was important for us to see what would happen through the seasons, and that was, of course, much easier to do by computer. Uh, next slide, please. What, however, was much more interesting, this was work we were doing with um, Over Arab in London, <coughs> and we are continuing to work with them on the same... Uh, in the same way. I'll show some more work. Um, uh, this is a daylight program that they're working on with us. This is, um, this is a computer image. And their program now can deal with uh, reflect, refracted light, refracted light, reflected light. So we're not talking anymore just about light and shadow, we're talking about an absolute um, simulation of 
the light quality of the room. And what's extraordinary is that, I mean, I'm not saying this is a nice room. I mean, it didn't, I mean, don't look at it as a room because it wasn't. But this is showing the two skylights that were, in fact, the swimming pool is over, over here. And this skylight is coming from behind the swimming pool, and this is in front of the swimming pool. Um, not only could we calculate by, you know, uh, uh, contours and see, you know, at a certain, if we made the, the skylight so big and so deep, uh, whether in July, as in the case here, you know, it became too bright and the fall off over the dimension of the wall, maybe it's too much. But actually we can show it nearly in its material, you know, form where, where light can actually become part of your composing, you know, stuff. Now at that point, you know, I think I forgive computers for all the time they waste. <coughs> Next, please. So that was a, that's a view of it the other way. The, here's the pool. These were the two skylights. One here and one here, and the gallery was under here. So it was very important that we could show that we could get a sufficient light to the walls. Um, even, you know, with the depth that they were achieving. Next slide, please. This is the project <coughs> we're doing now for Olivetti. It's, a, it's actually a, um, a theoretical project. Olivetti have asked myself, Jack Herzog, and Eduardo Suta de Moura to design a sort of ideal office bank. And so it's a completely theoretical project. I mean, quite honestly, any project in Italy is theoretical, but um, this is um, <laughs> theoretical from the beginning. And uh, we're using this, uh, we're working with Overarp, <coughs> doing the same daylight calculations. So we are composing some of the interior spaces on this and making decisions based on the daylight qualities that we can perceive, which is a very interesting thing. More than that, I mean, there's a, there's a, there's a sort of theoretical <coughs> um, experimental basis to this building. What, what we're, we're also trying to show a certain um, energy efficiency. And in the same way that we can uh, calculate um, and speculate on very complex um, lighting conditions, uh, which of course change from season to season and, and within the day, and so we have to be able to um, speculate that. We're also doing the same with um, thermal calculations, and this project is <coughs> uh, working without air conditioning uh, with a certain amount of natural ventilation and something uh, that their Arabs are calling a, a cold structure. Uh, the issue nowadays is not to, to heat the building, it's, it's the problem to take um, is to keep it, keep it cool um, because of the heat that's generated by everything else. Um, it's, it's quite easy just to put a bit more um, warm air, or well, not warm air, but to, to heat the building up. And what we're trying to do on this is instead of heating air, we're trying to um, control uh, thermodynamically, I guess, um, the, 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 the temperature of the structure. <coughs> so what happens, I and mean it's difficult to see here, but there is a primary structure all in concrete. All the surfaces are exposed concrete, but these primary beams <coughs> are taking, are cast with um, uh, a small, very small ducts inside. When the temperature of, uh, when the, uh, in certain seasons, cold air is pushed into this, um, through this concrete structure, all the primary members and the beams, uh, and therefore what happens is that instead of tempering the air, you're tempering the, the mass of, in a way you're recreating a sort of thermal control of the mass of the building. 
which is, which is why, you know, traditionally buildings of great mass performed very well because they sort of held energy efficiently. So this is a sort of, we're trying to get back to a condition where we can <coughs> um, uh, control the temperature of the building as opposed to temperature of the air. Now the reason why we can now speculate about that is that it's, it's much easier by, by computer calculation to prove where the, the problems of, you know, um, under what conditions that system might, may or may not work. And I think it's probably something which was very difficult to contemplate before. And I think that computers are giving us the possibility to examine alternative technical solutions. Whereas in the past, the easiest thing would be to, to bung air conditioning in, to bung air conditioning in because you could say, well, air conditioning would cope with all, all sorts of unforeseen conditions. You can now foresee those conditions. And what I like about this work um, is that through you know, the sophistication of computers, we're actually getting back to a much more primary um, you know, use of, of uh, our environment. It sounds sort of corny. I don't mean it to sound you know, sort of green and all that sort of thing, but we can, in a way it is, but you know, from my point of view, more importantly, um, it's allowing us to speculate about things which have a sort of a basic logic. I mean, I think it's much more interesting to open a window when you're too hot than to, and to, to design a system which allows you to open a window than to be in a situation where, because technology is so sophisticated, you can't open the window. And I think we're now going into a new phase of technology where we can actually get it to work much closer for us. Um, so this is... Uh, a project. I mean, it's still, this is a working model, but um, next slides. I might be able to show that. There's a sort of surrounding, there's a wall that surrounds it and forms a series of courtyards inside. <coughs> um, I mean, there's a series, of course, formal ideas as well as the technical ideas about um, protected spaces. Next, please. And this, this was, is the skylight which is allowing the light into the center of the building. It's also allowing, it's a sort of thermal chimney so that when the air gets too hot, it sits up here. The other thing that, for instance, that we're calculating, this is a north light. <coughs> and one of our concerns is that the light from the north will be too cold. I mean, it will be giving us a blue quality all the time. So again, with a computer program, we can calculate uh, cuts into the south elevation so we can sort of you know mix a bit of, of warm light into the into the brew um, but still have a sort of still be able to check the thermal um, consequences of doing such a thing I mean, it's sort of it's beyond me but you know the the, the base palette of, of these decisions becomes Fantastic. Next, please. Um, I mean, one has to say that it starts a bit earlier than that as well because it's no good going to all these sorts of considerations if the, the level of daylight in any of the working spaces is such that, you know, the lights must be on all day. So, again, we're designing the working space in such a way that they work the, the dimensions facilitate the best natural daylight for the longest period you know, on your desk. Next, please. Um, I've, thr I've now just thrown... Um, yeah, I should start to wind up. There's two projects which I've thrown in. This I don't... I mean, I'll skip this one. It's a, a competition we did last year. It, it shows a certain number of themes which are sort of consistent to the work now, which is uh, it's a gatehouse to a park and we built these long walls and made a court uh, and then uh, and the protected court is in here and then, well, I, I don't really want to explain it because we don't have time. Uh, maybe we can jump this one. Next slide. 
Next slides, please. I mean, form, I mean, uh, the thing I haven't explained on the project before is, of course, there's a certain number of formal games and ideas about um, yes, form and materials which are uh, pr prevalent in these projects. And, and this, I suppose, to start, I threw this in slightly to reinforce that, you know, the presence of that formal and compositional, um, those games. Next, please. Um, this is another project which we're struggling to build uh, or to struggling to get permission for, should I say. <coughs> uh, it's a church, a very large church in, in London, <coughs> which was built in the beginning of the century. It was for uh, a Christian sect called the Christian Scientists. Uh, they were from America. They were unbelievably successful in the beginning of the century, uh, very wealthy. Uh, this church seated about 2,000 people and it was full you know, every day. It's like a sort of opera house. <coughs> the congregation now is about uh, less than 100. And the, the project was to build a smaller church inside the existing. So we, because of planning constraints, we kept the, all the walls, and in fact, even the roof. And the proposition is to build a 14-meter cube. You can see here. 14-meter um, cube within the, the larger building. Next, please. So there you can see this cube. The facade is sort of treated, or the, it's not quite like this. More, you can see it here better. We had an advantage from the beginning that, that um, this colonnade existed so we could hold back from here and form some sort of inside-outside spaces. Here's the, uh, the cube. <coughs> um, I mean the, other thing I, the other reason I showed these drawings is that this is <coughs> these drawings are done out of a certain frustration of, um, again, trying to do, trying to, um, in drawings, demonstrate, <coughs> of course, in a formalized and stylized version, you know, light and material. But to some degree, the dissatisfaction with this as a process um, and, the, and the stylization of it has pushed us into this um, development with computers. Next, please. This is showing the box underneath the existing roof. Yeah. Okay. Next, please. Okay, this is a project we're going to build in England, of all places. Uh, Surprise, surprising experience for us. Um, <coughs> it's a museum in Henley for uh, rowing. No. This. And um, the Henley, as you might know, is the uh, mecca of, uh, you know, rowing. Every year on June the 7th or the 4th to the 7th or 4th to the 8th, uh, the f first Sunday in June or the first week of June, the whole world, the whole rowing world comes to Henley. <coughs> and uh, Henley is, in the, is a typical uh, southern England, you know, home counties, ultra-conservative uh, town. You can't imagine a more conservative place in a way. Um, they're so conservative that they, even they, most of the residents object to the regatta, you know, they think it's an interruption for their normal civilized life. Uh, instead of being, you know, excited that such a thing happens. Uh, so when we received the commission, <coughs> as well as being excited about it, of course, the first thing which happens in England when you get a, a project is a sort of fear which comes into you, which is to say, how are you going to get permission to build anything? Um, it's really the first thing when you get a project in England is not to worry about the cost or the program or the client or anything. The first thing is to worry about the planner. How to get, you know, how could you possibly get a permission in such an area? Um, I, when Henley is made in the summer, what's rather beautiful is that a sort of temporary town arrives. These um, uh, tents come. This is where they, they keep all the boats <coughs> for the races. Um, they build all these um, 
wonderful structures in the middle of the river for people with silly hats to stand in. Um, and the whole place sort of changes. <coughs> and um, I sort of took a clue from, from these um, sheds. I also, uh, you know, you only have to see these, uh, these are modern ones, but even then, they're absolutely beautiful objects, these sort of long, thin things. So the strategy was to, was to take the sort of boathouse form. I mean, you, you know, if one wanted to be cute about it, it exists here as well, but I, mean, I wasn't particularly interested in being vernacular. Next, please. Um, I suppose I was interested in trying to get planning permission. <laughs> and uh, <coughs> so, and in fact, this is the project as it is now. Even this is the second permission. Now, there's a very interesting strategy which <coughs> I have adopted in England now, which is called, you know, sort of two bites at the cherry. Um, in theory, in, in the the planning officer cannot um, dismiss your project for aesthetic reasons, in theory. <coughs> um, but all he has to do is to say, well, he thinks the building form is inappropriate for the area, or something like this. So, uh, and at that point, uh, you don't get your permission. What, what, he really says, what he's really saying is he doesn't like the way it looks. Um, so when you're trying to get permission, uh, in principle, to build the building, um, the, the planner can, can say, well, I don't like very much the, you know, the column on the front edge of the, you know, maybe you can make it bigger. And you have a choice. If you don't make it bigger, you don't get the permission. If you make it bigger, you get the permission. So we did one, we got the permission by doing a sort of compromised project. Um, not so bad. Uh, and having got the permission, because, the cl because they didn't have the money to build it, and I knew that. Uh, we then did our own, pro we, we took the project again and drew it exactly how we wanted from, from the same silhouette, but changed all the detail exactly how we wanted. For instance, I wanted these boxes floating, these closed uh, boxes floating on the thin columns, and the planner in the first instance didn't want. Once you have the permission, then uh, they can't refuse you again. I mean, if you go back with the same silhouette, the same form, but you change all the columns, he can't say, ah, I refuse the permission because of the columns. So what we now, what we've, we received two weeks ago, permission for the, the revised project which the planner couldn't object to. And I suppose the, the sort of overall idea is that um, in some ways there's a sort of traditional form and even traditional materials. This is black, uh, black wood, which is quite common in, the, in uh, this area of London, uh, this area of England. And that all the, the, the big decisions are, you know, in a way, the formal decisions are quite traditional and vernacular. But as you come closer to the building, you realize that all the smaller decisions are, you know, working and eroding and, and sort of questioning that. This is a section showing the big boat spaces in the roof with taking light only through the roof, so they're closed rooms. And this is showing the, the sort of uh, more open exhibition spaces, showing the sort of glass. Next, please. This is the back of the building. We had to, got to provide loading places for the boats. Next, please. Um, as I say, it seems like we might, we're about to start working drawings and, and uh, someone has appeared with four million pounds and uh, is paying for the project, so we'll start the construction uh, middle of next year. Next, please. Okay, for the last um, ten minutes, I want to uh, show some work in Japan, two pro well, really one project in Japan, but I'm going <coughs> to show a couple of smaller things at the same time. This is Japan. <coughs> Welcome. Uh, this, is, this is the typical view of, um, from the train 
uh, along the eastern seaboard of Japan, anywhere from, from the north, from Hokkaido down to, to uh, you know, Hiroshima or somewhere. It doesn't really change. You, know, you have this uh, uncontrolled uh, uh, development. There are some patches that, uh, you know, sometimes you see some fields, and, but generally the flat land is built or in very intensely farmed. Um, <coughs> even when you come into Kyoto, you know, you see this. Someone says, you know, your first visit, someone says, this is Kyoto. And you say, no, it can't be. <coughs> the only other thing that you see, <coughs> and in a way it sort of, it explains why you see that, is this, <coughs> which is the bit you can't build on and the bit they leave alone. And in a way, it's the bit that... Um, uh, um, keeps them connected to nature. It's the, the mountains become sort of symbolic of, of, uh, of nature because all the flat stuff, you know, is built. So you never see, I mean, in England you see landscapes, which are, you know, you go on the train and you see fields with cows and, you know, you can imagine that Turner might have painted this or, you know. In Japan, the, the flat landscape is pragmatic. It's, it's, um, it's either built on or it's farmed absolutely intensely. So there are these extraordinary extremes where you, know, you either get dense settlement or you get um, you know, this extraordinarily romantic mountain condition. Next slide, please. Um, I've, I built, I've built three buildings in Japan. This was the first one <coughs> and the one where um, I suppose I... Uh, burnt my fingers and got a bloody nose and learnt how to work in Japan. Um, it's a small private museum uh, in the northern suburbs of, of, um, uh, of Tokyo. The museum effectively is, uh, this wall is about four meters above ground. Um, the museum, the roof of the museum is here, so the museum is by and large on the ground. And above ground are uh, eight, student, eight rooms for students. There are four on this floor and four on this floor. <coughs> and uh, existing on the site before was a small house. And the theme that uh, I took, and it's a sort of continuous theme, and of course I showed it in the house for the photographer. There was a sort of idea that the inside spaces and the outside spaces worked in this interlocking and sort of ambiguous <coughs> way, which is a, you know, obviously a, a connection to traditional Japanese architecture. So I was very interested <coughs> about, you know, what, where the facade was as a, as, a, as a sort of boundary, but on the other hand, where the, the sort of definition between inside and outside was. So I wanted to try and uh, pull apart these, these layers of a facade. I mean, I think in, in modern architecture, we've become so used to the, the facade existing in, you know, 280 millimeters or 240 millimeters. And what's, um, you know, very extraordinary in traditional Japanese architecture, not modern Japanese architecture, is, you know, the layers of the facade so that you, you find that there are spaces on the edge of the building which are sort of zones, which are um, somewhere between the inside and the outside. And of course, it exists in Western architecture as well, in great tradition. So this project was very much trying to play with cloisters and, and balconies, which were like extensions to the rooms and, and courtyards. Next, please. Uh, we were looking at this facade here. The ground level is here. Um, the museum is, the, the main gallery space is here taking light from, the, from the, the back and from two big windows which stick up here um, and from a courtyard here. Although that's the facade, the skin comes back to here and then back to here and then out to here. So the sort of skin and the facade are moving apart all the time. Next, please. To get to the rooms on the, on the top floor, there are staircases from this gallery which take you up 
to a small little court on the, in the roof. So there's a sort of transparency through the building, again, forming a sort of... Um, so that each room has its sort of little outside space. You can see on that slide, you know, this, the facade is a sort of free thing. Next, please. This is the gallery space. Uh, this is eight meters below ground. And what's um, the light in Japan in the winter is, is beautiful. So you get very strong daylight. We had tremendous um, structural problems on this building. The, the, the piles go down 32 meters. Next, please. So this is another building that, in fact, the last building we completed. I'm just going to show a few slides of, of this. Um, the same sort of themes. This is a, a, a large office building in the south of Japan. Uh, the building is facing absolute south. Uh, it's in a sort of, uh, yes. The okay, here you can see. Very sensitively placed in the context. <coughs> um, this facade is, <coughs> the Shinkansen is here. There's a main road here, which gives the reason why we can build so tall. This is a, a screen filtering the light to the main office spaces. On the top are um, rooms for the director and executive. This space here is here. This is a, and, and these spaces, um, you know, look up to the mountains. You can see the mountains here. There's a sort of, again, this idea that when you get to a certain height, you can look over this mess and <coughs> reconnect with the mountains. So even on these big scale projects, there was, there's an idea to, to um, you know, pull the light, to play with the light, to play with the views, and to, you know, at the lower levels of the building, exclude the views. Next, please. And then, <coughs> you know, to make structures which then are eroded, and so you find courtyards uh, placed and windows to courtyards <coughs> in facades, and then, you know, in, in, in windows connecting the inside and the outside. So there's a sort of puzzle of an interconnection. Next, please. This is the reception when you arrive on the first floor. And the first thing you see when you arrive is the courtyards of the building. And then through the courtyards, you see this window, which is a sort of chosen view towards the mountains. Unfortunately, there's a sports <coughs> pylon in the way. Next, please. And um, I suppose the other I mean, yes, I suppose part of the language of this um, exclusion of views and emphasis of others is, is devices to, to give this ambiguity of boundary. <coughs> so this is the concrete boundary of the, build, of the site, which in fact is here. This screen is it's, um, this screen. So gradually what's happened now, we've planted this space in here, and there are vines growing on here. There's a big house here, which is rather ugly. So this screen is closing the view to that, and this is giving a sort of illusion of, of you know, you don't know where the edge of the building is. Next, please. Okay, last project. This is, um, I suppose, the main project in Japan, uh, a building in Kyoto. Uh, it's a combination of functions, primarily, um, uh, showrooms. There's a restaurant in the basement, showrooms on the, a car showroom on the ground floor, furniture showrooms on the upper floors, and an apartment on the roof. This was the photo, this is a photograph from the building that existed on the site before. So here you see, you know, the normal Japanese streetscape. But in this part of the city, we're very close to the mountains, just to the northern edge. And here you can see the other mountains. Um, yeah. Next, please. This was the site we had here, 35 meters long. 
This was the building existing before. And this is the delicate uh, intervention <laughs> nestling comfortably with its neighbors. <coughs> At the beginning, I, was, I kept saying to the clients that I was worried about these buildings here. You know, shouldn't we have some restriction about them? And they said, no, no, we own these buildings and we'll pull them down in five years' time. So if, if you make a relation to that. There is, though, I mean, a very... Um, you know, obvious, obviously conscientious and rigorous urban planning rule that we can't go more than 10 meters if we're so far back from the main street. The main street is here. So, um, unlike England where we can't do a thing without, you know, um, you know, everything is predetermined. The only rule we had was that we must keep below 10 meters up to this point. Um, and what you'll see is that <coughs> there are a series of, of walls and boxes as a, effectively a 10 meter tall box which contains all the showrooms. There's a pavilion on the roof which re-engages with the, the mountains. Next please. <coughs> so this was one of the early study models. Here you can, s this is the street side. Here's the 10 meter box. This box was all about, you know, creating a sort of womb-like and, and abstracted internal landscape. In contrary, when you arrived at the roof, it was about, you know, a sort of horizontal um, uh, and you know, panoramic view connected back to the mountains. Next, please. So this was a sketch sort of showing how the roof would become a sort of new datum for this pavilion for the owner. So there's a sort of roof terrace here. Next, please. Can you push that one down? I'm sorry. Thank you. Um, and exactly the same way as I was showing before, that, you know, over here is that little house and all the other houses. And so, there is a, um, an exclusion of the context by all the layering of different walls. First of all, a concrete wall, and then this timber wall. This is a passage walking across um, a light well here. And this wall is, well, in fact, it's, it's sort of this high, so it's allowing you to look down and allowing you to look up, but it's not allowing you to, to look out. You enter the building here, either by going up the staircase to the upper showrooms or into the, lower sh the ground floor showroom here or this way down to the basement. Next. When you arrive at that staircase, sort of behind the facade there's a stair which is you know, open to the sky. This is the entrance to the ground. Here you can see the stair going up, so it's sort of some It's sort of inside outside. It's trying. It's it's um, trying to to make the outside spaces of the building as prescribed and, and as as part of the interior. As you know, so the, the the characteristic of being inside or outside is 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 ambiguous. Next, please. This is the when you arrive at the top of that stair. Here is the top wall here. This is the, the 10 meter wall. And this is the pavilion. So y you can see that even though you're behind the facade, you're sort of open to the sky. Yeah, it's the same view at night. Next, please. Can you? Oh, okay. Uh, this can show, in a way, these different layers. <coughs> Here's the outside wall. Here's a timber wall. This is the 10 meter concrete wall here. This is a metal wall here, which is this one. Uh, the same thing happens on the other side in a number of cases. So it's like an onion, but you've got these layers of onion, which by the time you're arriving into the building, you're, you're, you're disorientated from your context. Next, please.
Here you can see again from the other side the sort of different layers of the onion allowing light to come in obliquely or through diffuse through glass block or so it's a it's a yeah, it's contained. Next please. And that's what happens when you arrive at the roof, then you're there's a sort of new datum. And then at that point you're you're literally, because of the constraint of ten meters everywhere else, you're literally at the the level of the mountains. Next please. Japanese concrete. Next, please. So this is the sort of typical condition of the interior, which is very bright, but very excluded from the outside. By the time you've arrived here, you know, you're, you're, you're quite disorientated from your physical context, from, you know, your external physical context. It becomes a new sort of landscape. Next, please. I should also say there are two, because there are interconnected showrooms, there's two systems of circulation. One interior and the other which is that staircase which I showed you before. This again shows you, you know, this boundary between inside and outside. We're, look, we're inside looking at the end of the bridge. This is the end of that wooden wall. So in whichever part of building you are, you're, you're sort of in the building. This is this, is this door. When you arrive at the bridge, you either come here, up the stair, or through this door. And if you go through this door, or this gate, you come here and down this stair. You can just see this uh, little building next door here. Next, please. And then when you come down that stair, you arrive in this pool. Next, please. So in fact, the view from the sort of next view is, and this takes you to the restaurant. So you go down, around, along, and enter the restaurant back here, which seems a very complicated way to arrive, because here's the street. You've come along a bridge, down a stair, along here, around the water, and come here. But they were delighted with this idea because it was you were experiencing the dimensions of the building, and, and in fact, <coughs> I mean, I didn't mean to mean it, but. They immediately said, ah, yes, this is very traditional in Kyoto. You must walk down a passage to find the, the restaurant. <coughs> yes, of course. <laughs> <coughs> Next, please. So when you finally come here, <coughs> I mean, in a way, this is the ultimate, you know, disorientation that you've finally, you're in a world where you have light, and you have the water, and you have these walls, completely abstracted in the, in the landscape of the building. On the contrary, if you arrive in the, on the roof, then you're re-engaged with the mountains. In fact, this is the site of one of the bonfires in the summer. Uh, there's a festival where they, they burn bonfires in, I think, four or five places on the, on the mountains to bring the spirits back. So, you know, the, just reinforcing this idea that the mountains are, you know, absolutely um, profound in, in, uh, in this culture. And in a way, for me, this was, you know, the sort of, um, uh, this is the, the image I, I prefer most of the building, which is that the building, you know, finally, or these two images, you know, in the end, <coughs> the boundary between sort of architecture and this sort of um, physical, environmental um, uh, construction is very vague. Thank you very much. I hear you a lot of uh, Japanese comment. It was very uh, compliment, and I enjoyed it. But basically, I'd like to ask one thing: uh, If do you think uh, there is any difference in uh, social role, the role of architect in uh, Japan and Europe? 
if there is some differences. And if you could explain with some example, I'll be quite happy about it. Well, first of all, the architects are treated with respect in Japan. Just <laughs> the main difference, I think. Um, it's a big question. Yeah, of course, there's you know, a huge difference. We don't have a master system that exists in Japan, um, for a start. You know, that when <coughs> architects in Japan become masters, in some way their career is inevitable. People like Tange, especially Tange, um, and now is Osaki, in a way. And I don't think we have such a, an Ando. You know, Ando's become a master, in a way. And we don't have such a... I mean, I suppose Foster has become a master so <laughs> in England, but <coughs> and, well, I suppose we're doing this. Um, I think probably one thing which is different is that uh, certainly there's an Anglo-Saxon tradition of, you know, explaining everything by way of, you know, rather practical and pragmatic um, uh, conditions. You know. You often hear English architects saying, well, you know, the problem was the site was facing north and uh, the family had uh, two cars and six dogs and so we had to do them. And, uh, and uh, the site was, the soil conditions were very bad and so <coughs> And so we sort of explain in this sort of, you know, and the client is always very present, you know, we always refer to the client. I once heard um, Shinohara give a lecture and I think he must have shown 30 houses um, one after the other, uh, there was not one mention of a client, a site, a problem, anything. Just, uh, this is a house about column. <laughs> and this, you know, ten houses in the series about column, and then ten houses in the series about column and beam. And he was only interested in the intellectual idea. There was no, the client didn't exist. And in fact, I knew the client of one of his houses, and one of the first houses he did, and he didn't put a toilet door on the bathroom. He decided that they didn't need to have a, a door on the bathroom. It was a sort of, I don't know why, I don't know where this concept comes from. But <coughs> there was no door on the toilet. <coughs> and in Japan, of course, you observe what the architect tells you. So uh, this girl, I know, she remembers growing up, always having to sing when she was on the toilet. You know. <laughs> and it lasted for about five years. <coughs> until finally they decided, even <laughs> against the wishes of the architect, that they needed a bathroom door. But it took them five years, you know. In England it would take a day. <laughs> but they won't tell Ando. Yes, but uh, if, you, if you look at these examples here and there in Japan, probably do you find something, uh, something lacking in Japan or something really overwhelming in Europe or some, some differences or not? <laughs> well, there's like three questions there. I think Ando has clients that are not so happy with his building, but they wouldn't tell him, you know, they're the position of the architect is, you know, is a revered one. Um, in any way, it, the basis on which they're not happy is, is often a sort of complex one, you know, like the roof leaks or something like that. <laughs> Sorry, I, I mean, I can't really answer that any better. Attacked by all the Japanese. <laughs> <laughs> I give up. Uh, you mentioned also uh, about I mean, you are interested in the light, um, the treatment of light. And obviously, you know, the quality of light uh, in Japan and here or in England is really different. But uh, when you do, you design the building, uh, you have some kind of uh, uh, different treatment um, with the light um, when you uh, design it. Building in Japan and uh, in England, we have some different kind of idea about 
Yes, I mean, I think the main difference, <coughs> in my experience, I mean, just not, not scientifically, but just in you know, experiencing, is that in Japan you get very good uh, light in the winter. The, the winter days are very clear, often in, the, in a way that the weather is better in the winter, you know, in the summer. You're having, you know, a lot of humidity and often typhoon and the, you know. So there is a very particular quality in the, in the winter and even in the early spring of, of light, which we rarely get. I mean, we do, I mean, <coughs> today we had it here also. I mean, this was in a way a sort of typical winter Japanese day, no? you know, it's a sort of very crisp winter light. And I think it's very forgiving, that light, you know. I mean, one of the problems, I think, for instance, in concrete, using concrete in England, is that in the winter, you know, from September till March, it's raining, so it's wet for, for uh, all the months where it's also cold and where the sky, sky is grey. Whereas in Japan, it's wet, you know, in uh, August, especially, you know, August, September, maybe, and uh, when the weather's warm and it's, it's not so depressing. <coughs> And I think that's the reason why, for instance, concrete is much more acceptable in, in Japan. In the winter, it's, you know, you've got blue skies and, and uh, fairly dry. Whereas in England, it's inevitably depressing. Now, that's not a scientific decision about, you know, what the quality of the light is. That's just another, you know, another aspect of it. Um, certainly, <coughs> In terms of, um, uh, you know, this project I showed about a, um, a house in, in Italy, at that point we're doing calculations based on, you know, ge its, its geographic position and what the, what the sun is doing, which is a slightly different, I mean, it's, it's a good point that <coughs> that doesn't necessarily take into consideration things that we've just been talking about, about you know, weather the light in the winter is, is clearer, for instance. Yeah, I'm not Japanese. <laughs> what, what I find interesting is that uh, during our, our master classes, we host Tada and the Steel Hall and you. And uh, if one would look into the books which have been published and uh, to the person who write the introduction for all three of you, that's Ken Frank. Um, it's a club. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, then one comes maybe to the Ken's inspiration from Frankfurt School and to give Jürgen Habermann's uh, lecture about modernity as an incomplete project. And uh, my question would be, is it really incomplete? And uh, how are you working to complete that project? Thanks for asking such a <laughs> 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 possible question. Um, of course it's incomplete, and of course I don't believe it can be completed. I, I think that completion is, you know, and we started on this discussion last night, is suggesting that there's some sort of theological center. And I was rather disappointed in a way with Ben's sort of attitude that <coughs> um, uh, that, you know, a sort of moral and ideological position was unacceptable and therefore we should, you know, to some degree abandon ideology. And at that point, all decisions are equal. And I find that a terrifying prospect. On the other hand, I think we've become, and I understand why he's veering to that direction, and I think it's probably, there is, there is something within our, my generation which probably links a whole series of us, <coughs> which is probably a fear of um, you know, any notion of the a theological center any notion of uh, a, a universal ideology. Now, the danger of saying that one is, is um, uh, uh, critical of a, of a 
of ideology is it suggests that you're not interested in any ideology whatsoever. <clears throat> and I think Ken's, Ken Frampton's position on this, which I think is absolutely correct from where I stand, is that <clears throat> it's not that, the, that we should abandon ideology, but that we should reconsider the relationship between ideology and architecture. And whereas I believe that the modern movement um, in, at times found itself where <coughs> uh, with a dis quite a great distance between these uh, ideological, and, you know, nearly theological um, premises and buildings themselves. I think Ken Frampton's notion of, you know, a, a sort of critical regionalism, which everyone took to be in some way a sort of, you know, modernism that happens in Portugal. Um, uh, really, I think what he was saying by regional wasn't that <coughs> it happens in provinces, but that it, it's a, a, a local ideology, and that, and that ideology, ideology should exist more local to, to, architecture, to the project of architecture itself. And the architects which he would you know, promote, of Snozzi or Caesar or Ando, you know, are good examples of that. It's not just because they live in regions, but it's, it's the fact that they're interested in, in finding a very close link and a critical you know, link between their idea and, and architecture, and that the, the ideas are within architecture itself, not somewhere else. And I think that's probably a, a situation where I don't think, <coughs> once you're in that situation, I don't think there's anything else to complete. I mean, it's not um, and, and I think that the danger is that we tend to continuously go back to notions of, you know, universal ideologies and then a sort of, n therefore, a notion of truth. And I agree with Ben on that, that I think if morality is suggesting truth, then I think it's dangerous. But I think if morality is, accept is, is suggesting that, <coughs> you know, one has to develop a sort of value system and that there are better ways of doing something or worse ways of doing something within a series of, you know, critical judgments, then, you know, I have no, you know, I think that has to be the basis of architecture. And I, and I think that, <coughs> you know, I think there's a whole generation now putting ideas into the buildings. I mean, I think you take the work of Herzog Demeron, I think they're, they're doing this better than anybody. You know, each project has an idea in it. And it's not an idea that necessarily has to be in the next one. It's an idea about that project and it's a sort of unashamed idea, but it, it's in the building, it's not a sort of um, manifesto, which an umbrella, which then goes over the whole, you know, raison d'etre and, 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 and suggests, as you say, a sort of completion. So I think we should stop here our time and have a drink, have a look at your book, and I thank you and I thank David for addressing his lecture. Thank you.